So I'll be talking about uh, graph neural networks today. And to start with, I guess the main question is, why should we care about graphs? Or maybe why should you care about graphs? Um, so to answer this, I'll kind of run you through my own experience and my own journey and how I became interested in graphs and, and why I think they're so interesting and so useful. So hopefully that will help answer that question. But before we start, um, I just want to make sure that everyone, we're all on the same page. And I'm not going to be talking about this kind of graphs or these plots or figures. That is not what we're talking about today. So if anyone came here thinking about this, that's not the case. I'm going to be talking about that kind of graph, um, those kind of graphs or networks. Um, is that? Yeah? OK. Yeah. So while they fix that, well, hopefully you'll hear me. Um, so I'll be talking about those kind of graphs or networks. And to do that, um, I've kind of created my own IG, my own influence graph that kind of runs through throughout my career and like the people that have influenced me and my own interest and my own work around, around graphs. So that hopefully uh, will give you a perspective or at least one of the... <laughs> I don't know. Can can anyone hear me anyway? If I speak like this, or uh, just louder, because Gosh. I okay. found the problem. So now you I... found the problem. Great. Right. So problem fixed. Hopefully, um, yeah. The idea is to kind of give you one of the different ways you can get into graphs or graph neural networks, because there are actually many different angles and perspectives that can take you to working in this area. So as you can see, I've kind of added an extra an extra node, an extra entity in our graph, in, our, in the influence graph, which is the M2L summer school. So that's you. And the idea is that after this lecture, I kind of want to ask you, you know, whether I have created some influence on you. And maybe if anyone has any idea after this on how we can use graph neural networks to make that inference, I think that's a good way to maybe get the question started. Um, right. So starting from the beginning, so in the introduction, I think they've mentioned it, but my background was in, ma in physics, so I started studying physics um, because I was interested in kind of like trying to understand, you know, how the world works and so on and so forth. But then at the end of my undergrad, actually, I think the, the phrase where I resonated the most with was that one. So all models are wrong, but some are useful. So it's like nice to try to model what happens around us, but also, you know, be aware that it's almost impossible to try to model and explain everything. Um, but basically, at the end of my undergrad, what got me interested in graphs was trying to study and start looking into complex systems and kind of systems that are uh, made of many different particles and specifically understanding how the interactions between these particles affect the model and affect the outcomes. And I guess that's kind of like what leads us to, to try to explain or to talk about the interactions between a certain system or among a certain system. So to start with, we'll describe, you know, how we can represent a graph. So or what a graph is. A graph is basically a group of a set, certain set of nodes or the entities in our system. This could be literally anything. In this case, that's kind of the graph of influence that I had in my, in my undergrad. So the nodes would be people, for example. Um, and then the connections are whether these two people, you know, interact or not. You can create a graph out of literally anything, as long as you know what kind of entities you want to have and what their connections are. And so, therefore, we have our graph. The two main components are the vertexes or nodes and the edges or connections between them. Now, we know that our nodes, our entities in the system, can have certain descriptors. So we can add certain properties um, and assign them you know, a description that could be vectorized. So in this case, for example, we could look into the people and then say, right, so what's their interest in graph themselves? What is their experience in working with on graphs? And potentially, like, what's their affiliation? So what this defines is this kind of feature matrix that's describing the features of the nodes in our graph. So that would be this x here. Now, to describe the structure um, that we have in our graph, then usually the most commonly use format is by using an adjacency matrix. So this is a square matrix where we have same number of rows and columns 
and each one of these kind of entries represent the connection between the different nodes in our graph. So we'll put a one if there's a connection, we'll put a zero if there's none. Um, and you can kind of see that in this particular kind of, in this particular graph, this matrix has some sort of symmetries already. We'll see how that affects um, our systems later. But the idea is that then you can define your graph. In this case, we have an undirected graph, so there's no direction on the edges or the connections. Um, you can add more information to your graph and actually add some of the connections um, or the, add some of the directions in, um, in the graph, and that's what we call a directed graph. And as you can see here, that does affect our adjacency matrix as well. Um, and then finally, there are uh, weighted graphs, where we can also add on top of that a certain weight or importance on the connection between nodes, um, and that's also kind of added to the, to the adjacency matrix. So other than these three main types of graphs, there's actually many, many more. Uh, we can, for example, look into connected or disconnected graphs if there's some of the nodes that are not connected to any of the other nodes in our group. Um, complete graphs, bipartite graphs, these are especially important for recommendation systems. For example, we have trees, we have cyclic or acyclic. These are, for example, properties that are very relevant when you work with molecules um, and trying to describe um, their characteristics, for example, or their functional um, attributes, simple multigraphs. And then other than that, there's also, we can look at more general properties of the graph um, and then talk about and do a classification on that. So we could look at, you know, for example, the distribution of the degrees of the nodes, um, the degree of a node being the number of node um, of connections that that node has. So if we look at general properties of the graph, we can um, define, for example, as a string, we can define small goal graphs, which, by the way, are quite relevant when you look at kind of biological systems, also social systems. Small goal graphs are um, those that have a few nodes that are very well connected, uh, that have very high degrees, and therefore that helps a lot with the connectivity. Um, so anyway, many different types of graphs. There's a whole world of kind of like exploration in that sense. Um, but what do all these graphs have in common? So kept saying that, you know, graphs are important, graphs are interesting, but the interesting part of graphs is that they add some sort of structure to, um, to our models. They, they add some sort of structure to the problem that we're looking at. And more specifically, they are defining a certain domain where we can then ask questions and try to seek for answers. Um, and then specifically, it will be interesting to look at the symmetries that this connectivity, this structure, is adding to, to the domain. So this is all a bit abstract still. I'm not got, I've not gotten into graph neural networks yet. Um, but that is kind of how I got started, actually, into looking into graphs and getting into graph neural networks. So after studying physics, went into kind of, I was very interested in graphs, so I decided to do an MPhil in complex systems in um, basically network science, that's what it was called. And at that point, I still haven't even touched machine learning. I basically was seeing these systems as, you know, a way to approximate functions, to kind of define models, um, and so on. And I think for the next kind of, the ne in the next slides, um, I want to explain and use some of the terms that are defined in uh, geometric deep learning. And this is something that came out quite a few years after, but I think it really makes that connection between the kind of geometric terms, the, the, the description of the domain where we're asking the questions and actually the functions and, and the, the problems, the questions that we want to, to answer. So basically, in geometric deep learning, the idea is that you know, we're looking at a certain domain, and in this domain, there are certain um, signals. So what, graph, or what neural networks do is do an approximation. This is like a very highly parameterized um, function, if you want, that is mapping from an input to a certain output. So this input, in our case, would be x, um, is lying on a certain domain. Um, and to kind of be maybe a bit more specific, if we look at this example, we have the picture of number three. So the picture of number three is um, kind of the signal that's on top of this grid domain. It's a grid of pixels, so it's a homogeneous domain. We have a certain signal on that, which is this number three. And now what we want our machine learning model, our neural network to do, 
is to define the label or you know describe it right so this is number three um, so the idea behind it is that you know we can leverage some of the symmetries that appear in our domain which is this kind of like homogeneous grid of pixels to then help making those predictions um, and we'll see kind of in this particular case well I'll give you an example this is um, maybe I'm going a bit too far ahead but if we look at number three and we're trying to make this prediction this mapping um, we can actually move the number three in our image so we can move the signal in our domain but we want our function to still map to the same label to the same output um, so that's what I mean by you know leveraging the symmetries if we know that in discrete domain the group of symmetries of translations um, is you know needs to be kind of preserved say when we then make the prediction then we can find structures we can find architectures that can do that um, anyway that leads me to the definition of two types of functions so we have invariant and equivariant functions so we've seen that when we're trying to predict the label of node 3 we want that to be invariant so we want the function that's making this mapping we want it to be invariant to translation so when we transform the input we don't want that to affect the output of our function that's what we call an invariant function um, and then there's another type of functions that are the equivariant functions and in this case, what, we, what happens is that if we do a transformation, like a translation, for example, in the input, um, we want that to have a certain effect um, that we can predict in some sort of way um, to the output. So an example on this would be if instead of predicting label, the label of number three, we want to do segmentation and say, right, where is this number three in our picture? Then, of course, if we move it, we want the function to also tell us that, you know, that number three has been moved. So that's what we call an equivariant function. And so the idea is that you know, we can create different functions um, and we can combine these functions to, to, for the particular problem, the particular question that we want to, to answer. In the case of you know, image processing, we have, for example, the symmetries, the group of symmetries of translation or defer also deformations. Um, and so we can define functions that are invariant or equivariant to, add to that. Another important property is scale separation. So, for example, if now instead of changing the signal, we're actually changing the domain itself, so we're making the grid um, maybe more coarse grained, we still can define functions that are either invariant or equivariant to that change and leverage that symmetry um, when we're training the models. Um, and so what I, what I really like about the geometric deep learning kind of framework is that you know, we can combine all of these different types of flavors, um, of flavors, these different flavors, if you want, of functions, and then get to any of the most well-known machine learning architectures um, that we know at the moment. Um, for example, you know, when we know that if we're working with uh, a domain that's a grid, for example, on images, we know that the symmetry group that is related to that is the group of translations so then we can define you know cnns by combining these different types of, of functions same with for example like if we're looking at sphere, um, spheres or a domain is a sphere is a 3d volume then we can basically leverage the the symmetry group of rotations and then construct uh, spherical cnns and i think what i want to focus really on today is the group of um, the domain of of graphs so when we're working on using machine learning um, on top of graphs um, and for that you may some of you may have seen maybe or like identified earlier some of the symmetries and where they come from but actually the symmetry group in graphs is usually permutations and we'll see next how that affects um, our networks but basically that's what defines GNNs so GNNs are architectures that are very good at dealing with um, the symmetry group of permutations so how do we define a permutation or what, what, how does that affect our graph? So that takes us to talk about the problem of graph isomorphisms. Um, and this is a very kind of like well-known challenge um, or question that appears in you know, graph theory, but also in a lot of kind of like more GNN graph neural network um, papers. And it's looking at the difference, how, how can we separate or differentiate two graphs? Because if you're looking at you know, a grid domain, there's not 
much to kind of ask because that's kind of homogeneous everywhere really. But if you look at graphs, the structure of the graph can change. Therefore, if you ask a question to one graph, you can get an answer, but then you don't know if, you know, ask the asking the same question to another graph, you will get the same answer. So this is quite important to identify whether two graphs are um, basically the same or not, isomorphic or not. So we define two graphs as being isomorphic if, when, if we can relabel the nodes um, of one graph to make them identical to the other. So now, I haven't labeled the nodes in my graph yet. Um, and the idea behind this is that graphs themselves shouldn't really have labels. So when we look at the structure of the graph, we don't really care about which node is which. But we're just looking literally at the structure and the connectivity of the graphs. So now, that, what that means is that if we look at this example here, actually these two graphs are isomorphic. Because basically, we could, if we label them, could kind of like exchange this third node and then kind of like flip it upside down and these two graphs are actually the same graph. Um, so maybe to expand on this, um, the idea is that then we can define automorphisms. So for a specific graph, we can look at all the different permutations we can make of the node um, to map it back to itself. So how many different kind of permutations, how many different constructions can we build from the same graph, um, basically to, to kind of evaluate how many different views of that graph we can achieve. Right. So in order to do that in a practical way, um, there's the WL test, there's the Weisenfeller Nachman test, um, which helps us test whether two graphs are isomorphic or not. So this is not a perfect test. And actually, it can tell us whether two graphs are isomorphic, but it can help us see whether two graphs are not isomorphic. And the way it works is basically we start, we initialize our, uh, the labels in our graph or the labels for the nodes in our graph um, randomly. Then we do some neighborhood aggregation. So we look at for each one of the nodes, what are their neighbors, um, and basically, assign it a new label according to that. And then we repeat this process until it reaches convergence. Um, that's kind of theoretically proven that it always reaches convergence. And at the end, what we get is these two distributions. So one distribution per graph. Um, and it's a distribution of the, say, like the node colors, basically. So if the two distributions are different, that means that the two graphs are non-isomorphic. If the distributions are the same, we actually cannot say you know, there's a probability that they may also still be non-isomorphic. So that's kind of a bit of a, not a, well, I don't know if it's a gap, but, but what that, actually the relation of this with graph neural networks is that we can find like an expressive, like the, ex, like the expressivity or the, the power of expression that our graph neural networks will have will be bounded um, by this problem here. So if, you know, we're not able to differentiate between two graphs, then our graph neural networks may also not be. Um, but that's kind of quite, um, I would say, more on the, on the theoretical side of explaining and understanding graph neural networks. It kind of gives us a good, a good basis to then now start looking into more the machine learning side of it. Um, and I think it's a good time to kind of go back to this um, influence graph um, because when I finished my, my, my MPhil, I sort of you know, exchanged my hats, started working as a physicist, then like, changed that for like maths. And now I was quite lucky to, to get a, a PhD offer um, from, uh, from a lab, but it was a computer science lab. So that kind of also changed again my, my perspective individually. Um, and actually, when I worked on my PhD, I did not work. I, did not, I initially started when it to work on graphs, um, and I was going to work on uh, basically using a graph of comorbidities and so on, but that was not the case. So I ended up working in something completely different or you know, somehow related. Um, but um, the idea is that during that time, I, had, I was very lucky and I'm very grateful that a, lot, a few of, the, of my colleagues in my lab were working on graph neural networks. And I would say that that time, at that time, that's when this influence graph was 
the most important for me because I managed to kind of keep up and do some collaborations with them on, on graphical electrodes. So I kept kind of up to speed with the things that were happening. That time is when also graphical networks were kind of getting more and more interest. So, so then that kind of takes us to, right, let's, let's talk about a little bit on the application of this graphical networks. We've seen that, you know, you can create functions on top of graph and so on, but the idea um, of machine learning, as we've seen, is to approximate functions, right? And we want to make some certain predictions. In our case, as we've seen, these functions, if we operate on top of graphs, will take as an input the feature matrix, so the kind of this X matrix, and will also take as an input the adjacency matrix. So now what are the outputs? What are we trying to kind of infer or predict from that? So they can be classified, I would say, in three levels. Um, you can make predictions at a node level, so trying to predict some of the properties of the individual nodes in your graph. Um, and in that case, the output would have dimensionality n by k, n being the number of nodes in the graph, k being the kind of dimensionality of your prediction. We can make predictions at an edge level, um, and in that case, we're trying to predict whether two nodes are maybe connected or what is the intensity of the connection between the two nodes. In that case, our output would be a uh, matrix of dimensionality n by k, n being the number of, of edges. Um, and then we can also make predictions at graph level. So that is when we're taking into account all the nodes and all their connections and we're predicting a certain number, say like a molecular property or, you know, yeah, there's many different kind of, we'll see later um, some of the actual applications. But going back into the kind of permutation, like the, the invariant versus equivariant function issue, in this case, what we're looking at is functions that will be permutation invariant or permutation equivariant, because this is the group of symmetries that we've seen that graphs have. So if we look at um, functions that are permutation invariant, for instance, if we have if we have this graph and we attach some sort of labels to the nodes in our graph, now we're permuting these two nodes here, nodes um, eight and nine, and then you see how that actually affects the adjacency matrix, that affects also the feature matrix. But if our function is invariant, if our layer in our neural network is invariant to that, then that should not affect the actual output. So the prediction, if it, for example, in this case would be at a, at a graph level. So the permutation of two nodes shouldn't affect the general um, prediction on that graph. And then again, we have also functions that are permutation equivariant. And in this case, if we're predicting at a node level, for example, we do, we will see that our output is going to be affected if we perform this permutation. So we need to be obviously careful and understand the problem well in order to you know, define and identify which kind, what kind of function, what kind of layer we want to use. Um, so, basically I've, I've spoken about this in a more sort of function approximation modeling uh, perspective. But actually the, um, I would say the building block of graph neural networks is this here, it's message passing. And message passing is what's happening at each layer of our graph neural network. So, Message passing consists on three steps. Um, that I'll explain a little bit more in the next slide. But basically, we start with the first step, which is creating messages for each one of the node connections. For each pair of nodes, we'll create a message. Then we'll aggregate these messages. And then we'll update the embeddings or the representation of our nodes um, <coughs> according to the messages and the aggregation that comes from their neighbors. So the first step um, basically can be defined as the, well, this is the sending step, as we've seen. And so in this case, if we look at node two, um, what will happen is that we'll generate two messages, one for each connection that node two has, um, message two one and message two three, right? I'm keeping it general and this kind of function, a message function can be literally anything. That is what actually is going to define the different architectures and the different models that we see in the GNN, GNN world. Um, but basically the function that takes into account or can take into account the two nodes that are interacting. Then there's the aggregate function. 
So once we've generated the messages, we'll use another function that will aggregate these two messages, right? And that function will give us you know, this sort of update or aggregated um, embedding for node two, if we still um, are talking about in this particular case for about node two. The interesting part of this is that this aggregate function should be permutation um, invariant. So basically, we don't want to care about the order of the messages. We just want to care about you know, the messages coming from, um, from the neighbor nodes. And then finally, there's the update function, we'll, which will take the original features of our nodes and the aggregated messages that are coming from their neighbor. So in this way, what we get is basically for each one of the nodes in our graph, we will perform these three different steps and we'll generate um, updated representations that will take into account their original um, description, so x, i, say, um, and also into account the descriptions of their neighbors. So that is the step that is kind of the process that happens in one of the layers in our network. Now we can stack them up and then what that allows us to do is to then gain access to farther and farther neighbors of the node. So we're still looking at node two. Um, on the first layer, we can connect it, we can generate messages that you know, are connected to the first neighbors of this node. If we stack another layer, then we'll actually be taking into account nodes that are two steps away. Um, and so on and so forth, we can expand that to basically build a network that's kind of deep enough to access all the nodes in our graph, if that's something that we're interested in. Although that also kind of brings on some challenges that, that we'll see later if we, if we do that. Um, but theoretically, you could. Um, right, so back to the, to the storyline, back to the, um, in my case, like my influence graph, so the next step is when I finish my PhD, I feel like that is kind of a common experience that you know, you've been working maybe for three, four years um, in a very specific problem. You have a lot of knowledge about that, but then you, know, you want to kind of have some time to digest and have some time to expand and look at other types of models and things. And that's, again, like what I, what I kind of did um, in my postdoc, and that's what I want to do now, which is tell you a little bit more about you know, how we can use this message passing framework and generate, create different models and architectures that, um, that are the ones that you may, if any of you has worked on graph neural networks, you may have used. Um, so I would say the most general one um, is the message passing neural networks. Um, and in this case, as we've seen, you know, they consist on three different types of, of functions. So for the sending function, will have something that will create messages um, according to the source and the input node, so xi and xj. Then the aggregate function usually is a mean or a sum. And then we'll have the update functions that are learnable functions. So in this case, we will learn how to um, aggregate the messages from the neighbors and the original input. I won't expand too much on this because what I really want to kind of start is building up from the I would say, I think, not the original graph neural network, but almost. So the first, one of the first models that came up um, was where graph convolutional networks. And I'm trying to get to the reference, which is at the bottom. Um, yeah, I'll just put everything out there and then we'll run, through, run you through it. So the definition of a graph convolutional network comes from these three different functions that we're using when, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Is that better? Oh, now I feel bad. Should I start again? <laughs> okay, maybe not. Um, and now, yes, now it is. Yeah, okay, I'll just continue. I won't touch anything. Um, right, so the way we define the different types of um, graph neural networks is by defining these three different steps on the message passing. So in this particular case, graph convolutional networks were one of the OG, one of the original kind of networks that, um, that were published, that were um, kind of, yeah, that came out. And for them, some of the properties they have is for the sending message, they actually only use at the source node. So uh, they only look 
basically at the definition of the source node. Um, then the next step is for the aggregate um, function. What they do is they aggregate all the features of the neighbor nodes, um, then basically normalize them by, by their degree or the number of connections they have. Um, but they multiply them by this weight matrix, which is what, we, what the network is trying to learn. So the network is trying to learn the importance of the feature descriptors to then do this aggregation and then influence or impact the, um, the source node. Um, and then finally, so there's the update function, which is basically the sum of the node itself for this multiplied by the, by the weight matrix, added, and then adding the, this aggregate um, of their neighbors. I think the interesting part of this, and this was kind of like early days, um, was that there were um, these GCM matrices can actually be reframed basically just as a matrix product. Uh, I don't know if you can see it there, but basically it's just a matrix product of the adjacency matrix, this, um, the feature matrix, and the, um, the weight matrix that we're trying to learn. So just kind of like to, to change a little bit the notation, we can see here that actually the predictions that we're trying to make in our graphs are nothing else than you know, this matrix um, product um, where in the adjacent matrix, we need to add the identity matrix. So we're kind of also adding self-connection loops if you want um, so that we take into account the, the representation of each node. Um, but yeah, I think this um, has some sort of limitation. I don't know if you can see it here, but I guess the main limitation of this is that we actually need to know the adjacency matrix um, itself. So we need to know the graph itself. So that um, is what kind of takes us to, to talk about these two different types of learning that we can do with GNNs. So that type of learning is what we call tran um, transductive learning, and it's when we apply and we learn on top of a specific or a certain graph. Um, so for that, we need to have access to the full graph, um, both for training and testing. Um, and the idea is that you know, some of the models that work on that are GCN. There's also some of these other models um, that were maybe a bit older or like that came before as well, GCNs, no to back the ball. And the idea is to make predictions on top of one graph that is well known. Now that's not, that sometimes can be useful when we're trying to predict, for example, um, node embeddings or make node classification on a specific graph that we know very well. But I think the interesting part comes when we try to do um, inductive learning. So when we don't, we may not have access to all the nodes or all the edges in our graph, or we may want to learn in one graph and then kind of apply that to other graphs. Um, and so that's what's called inductive learning. And that came kind of relatively soon after um, the first GCM paper, um, the same year actually, um, with GraphSage. Um, there's also graph attention networks. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this now um, as well. But the idea of this is that you can learn in one or several graphs um, and then basically translate or use those learnings for other graphs and other nodes. Um, right. So I don't know if we, I don't know if we want to stop for questions or maybe if you want, there's not that much left, so we can save the questions for the end. Um, so, but if there's anybody that's very lost or like you don't know what I'm talking about, um, feel free to ask maybe now. Otherwise, I'll take it as we're following. Um, right. So. Okay, I'll continue then. So I'll talk about GraphSage now. Um, and GraphSage, as I mentioned, um, is basically the one of the original, one of the first um, cases of induction or inductive learning in, in graphs. Um, you, by the way, you'll probably, I think you'll touch that on the practical session later, so you'll have the chance to kind of play around with it and, and um, kind of see what that is all about, but I'll run you through the, the main algorithm and how that works. So GraphSage stands for Graph Sample and Aggregate. Um, and the idea behind it is that we're now learning this aggregate function. So we're not just using learning this weight matrix, we're actually learning the function that will aggregate um, the node embeddings from the neighbors. So the idea is that we are initially, when we do this message passing, instead of doing the message passing using all the neighbors for our nodes, we take a sample of a number of the neighbors in our, um, 
in a graph. Then we defined, say, like the depth. So in this case, if we were looking at this initial node, um, we would do mini batch training on only taking a sample of its neighbors. So that um, allows us to kind of retrain um, the model and look at different nodes at different kind of steps um, of the training. Then the next step is um, doing this aggregation. So for this aggregation, that's what we, we want to learn. We can use different, also we can use different functions. You can, actually in the package, you can define whatever, um, whatever kind of function you want to use, but you can use mean, you can use LSTMs, or you can even use pulling. Um, so you could use some MLP, some neural networks to try to, to learn what is the best way to aggregate, um, the, to aggregate the, the neighbors always trying to account for this kind of permutation invariance. So we always want functions that are not going to be dependent on the order of the nodes that we take. Um, so that's kind of a, a good representation that's taken from the, from the original paper, um, where you can see that in order to learn, we first start with sampling, taking a sample, a subsample of the neighbors of our nodes. Then we aggregate this information, we learn a certain function, and then we relabel um, that node according to kind of these aggregation. Um, so one interesting part, I would say, of, um, of this paper was and, and this model is that it was initially proposed as an unsupervised learning um, problem. So you, the way they train the network is by trying to um, or encouraging nearby nodes to have similar representations. So what that means is that the representations that we're learning will be encouraged to be as similar as possible when they are kind of closer together in the graph and then as different as possible when they are far apart. So that's what the original kind of loss function was taking into account. Now, they also explain in the paper that you could add a supervised learning term in this uh, training function where you can potentially, if you know that you, know, you have certain clusters or you want to make a prediction on a supervised problem, you could add that to the training loss and actually f learn embeddings that are important for that. Um, and I guess this, I just added it as a, as a curiosity because going back to the WL test, which is this test that um, we used to to, to try to identify whether two graphs are isomorphic or not. Um, this is, you, we can see this uh, graph age algorithm as a, almost as an instance of um, the WL test if we take into account this kind of consideration. So if we take the depth of our graph age model as the total number of nodes in the graph, so we have access to all the nodes in the graph, um, we apply the weight matrices as the identity and we use um, a hash function that, has, that doesn't have any nonlinearities. We can actually, all of this is proved in the paper, so if you're interested, you can kind of like check that. But that sort of takes us back to, we could use this potentially to try to identify whether two graphs are isomorphic or not. Um, and this is uh, the algorithm itself. I think I'm probably going to skip that just so that you can... You can I think you will be actually using it in the in the tutorial in the practical sorry in the practical session later. Um, so I'll leave this kind of for you to to check if you're interested. Um, and I'll move on to graph attention networks. So these are one of I think this is one of the main um, kind of papers or applications. That's where you know the 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 world of like graph neural networks took a super big step forward in my opinion. Um, and is when we Actually, we can add to our um, we can add attention to our aggregate function. So now instead of just learning the same um, the same way matrix or the same way of aggregating for all the nodes in our graph, we can take into account or yeah we can learn um, different ways to aggregate according to the nodes that we're looking at. So according to the the node features and that. Um, that is something that we can learn or can be added um, by using, for example, graph attention network or um, self-attention. So there's different ways we can use attention in, um, in our graphs uh, or even our graph neural network. Um, and that is always on this aggregate um, function part. And again, the same, the other two steps of the message passing are going to remain the same. So still the send, um, the send step or the kind of message generation step 
will only take into account the source nodes, and then the update will be this kind of sum of um, the original features plus this aggregate function. So in the graph attention, um, graph attention network kind of paper, uh, they propose this multi-head attention. Um, so actually we can basically concatenate, use or learn attentions that will separate this kind of feature, um, feature aggregation and then basically concatenate them at the end to learn the new representation. Um, this has kind of positives and, and negatives. We'll see why we may want to um, use kind of uh, multiple attention heads or not um, next. But the idea is that you can use that um, and that is kind of, if for those of you that have worked with transformers, this is a um, quite an interesting application. So some of the other models that, um, you know, that are used or that are related to, to graph neural networks um, basically are very, like we have a very large diversity of models because it depends on the questions that we're asking um, the networks and depends on the angles that we're taking on, on research and, you know, we may want to explore um, one type of models or another. But the, one of the relevant ones, I would say, is the graph are the graph isomorphism networks. Um, when we're basically uh, kind of looking at the problem of graph isomorphisms, and they, this paper is quite interesting from the sort of theoretical point of view because it proves that graph neural networks cannot be um, or you know, have this upper bound of expressivity up to where um, the WL test kind of can achieve. So they basically try to optimize and build models that were as good as separating and identifying graph isomorphisms as the WL tests. Um, then another paper that I think is quite relevant, if you're interested in the problem of graph, graph isomorphisms and also kind of taking it to another to another level, if you want, um, is to look at subgraphs. So, so far we've, we've seen that when we're learning on our networks, we're performing the message passing, we're only taking into account two nodes and their connection. So now this paper, what they do is look at simplicial graphs. So then we can now, to do this message passing, we can look at more than two nodes. Um, so for example, triangles or even higher order subgraphs, um, and then generate neural networks that work on top of those. So that um, does allow us to maybe separate um, or find this solve in some way, um, this graph isomorphism problem to a certain extent. Um, and, and yeah, so this paper is quite interesting if you you know, want to look a bit more into higher order WL tests or looking at um, kind of subgraphs within, um, within this topic. And then finally, there's also an, another interesting application or the interesting paper is um, one that works on heterogeneous GNNs. So, so far we've seen that, um, well, the nodes and the edges that we were looking at were kind of like homogeneous, so we were not really differentiating um, between nodes, but we can actually also learn on top of heterogeneous networks, which is when we have different types of nodes, for example, and different types of edges. So what they did on that paper is to basically leverage and learn on metapaths, so we can kind of identify subgraphs according to this kind of different semantic representations of the nodes and edges, um, and then at the end kind of concatenate the um, predictions that we make, but during the learning, we can kind of keep it separate um, and learn on each specific metapath. Um, so again, I encourage you, you know, I, I think I've done my best to try to summarize this quickly, but I, I encourage you to like read more about and check these papers out if, if you're interested. Um, and I guess that kind of like takes, um, takes us to maybe the last bits of, um, of this talk, which is, you know, at this point, I kind of finished my postdoc and then I decided to, to move into industry. Um, I think in talking about kind of the influence graph and how that affected it, I would say now there's no directions on this graph. I would say probably the directions would be now kind of the opposite. So usually now I work with people that are not as familiar or maybe not as interested as well in graphs. Um, but I still get a lot of feedback and a lot of kind of um, ideas, especially um, in terms of the challenges that we face when we're trying to, to implement and, and apply this. So now like for the last bit, I kind of, I'll just touch on two of the main challenges that 
graph neural networks usually face um, when we're applying them and implementing them um, with real data. So the two challenges I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about are over-smoothing and over-squashing. So there are two, two problems that are over something. Um, so over-smoothing is when we lose basically information when we perform this message passing. So that happens when, as I mentioned before, we stack like many layers of this message passing on one network. And what does, that does sometimes is that instead of learning um, representations of nodes that are you know, important and that can help us answer questions, we're sort of disseminating the information and we're losing the kind of individual representations of the nodes. So we can kind of see here that that happens and that we can quickly see how that will actually affect the performance when we're trying to predict on, um, on this type of graphs when, when that's happened. So some of the solutions that um, we can use to avoid that happening is, well, first of all, maybe not making the, the models that deep. Um, but if we still want to do that, um, we can use normalization or regularization, um, which is basically a way to keep, or there's a few kind of functions um, and models you can use for that, for example, pair norm, where you're basically maintaining this um, pairwise different, um, distance between the nodes across the layers. You can also drop edges. So this happens a lot when you know, we have very highly connected graphs um, because basically the, it's, it's very hard to learn embeddings and it's very hard to not spread out all the information and, and like lose, um, lose power. So we can drop some edges, but of course that also comes with a cost because if we're dropping edges, then you know, we're losing information that may be relevant from the graph. Um, we can also add residual connections. Uh, so that is when we kind of um, introduce connections between layers so we can have access to some of the representations that were, um, were you know, represented in the, in the layer before. Um, so that does can help us also preserve some of this node distinction. Um, this one I, I particularly like um, because we can basically on these aggregating functions kind of flash back to, to, my, to my undergrad, but you can introduce actually oscillators or other kind of like dynamical ways of aggregating um, the node information and that also has been proven to help. You can add gated mechanisms to kind of control the flow of information. Um, and so, yes, there's, there's many kind of different ways we can try to tackle this problem of over-smoothing. Um, there's no one right solution, like it depends on the problem, it depends on your, um, on your graph, on your question, and so on. So there's some um, research, quite a lot of research that has been done around that, so feel free to check it out as well if you are interested. Um, and then the problem of over-squashing is almost the opposite. So in this case, what happens, um, over-squashing, appears when um, we have some information bottlenecks or some nodes that are actually bottlenecks in our um, graph. And these are, for example, in this case, when we um, have a node that is almost connecting two parts of the graph that are contain a lot of information, you can kind of see that if we're trying to transfer and to pass information from one side of the graph to the other and it needs to go through this bottleneck, sometimes what happens is that there's not enough capacity and we lose information. Um, so there's different ways we can solve that. Again, we can add um, wider aggregation or this multi-head attention um, approach where you know, we can increase the size of the bottleneck and then we can allow more information to pass. That's one way of doing it, although that's kind of harder than to train and to learn. Um, we can modify the graph structure, so we can, for example, add connections between distance no distant nodes. So we are sort of, again, kind of trying to, to solve this bottleneck issue if we're connecting and we're allowing the information to kind of pass through more distance nodes. Um, we can also um, kind of use diffusion, use higher order GNNs to sort of diffuse or aggregate the information and, and like spread it out globally across the graph. And one particular case that again, I think you'll see in the practical um, session later, is to use this expander graph propagation. So we can actually add a layer in our, um, in our GNNs, in our graph neural networks, that uses, defines and uses this particular type of graphs that are Cayley graphs. Um, and these graphs will have the same number of edges as original graph, it's just that the connectivity is different. Um, so 
in this case, the, the, the properties of the Cayley graphs that makes them very interesting is that they are very sparse, but also they are very well connected. So any node in a Cayley graph can be um, reached by no more than th four hops. Um, so by adding one of these layers, what we're doing is, again, kind of allowing the, um, the nodes to have accessibility to information all over, all over the graph. Um, so, so yeah, I guess like that is kind of more or less the, the, the overall vision of graph neural networks. And I guess like you may be asking, like, why did you add your family or like your friends in this influence network? Well, actually, because they, they do <laughs> influence me many times when, especially when I explain all of this to them and, you know, if they ask me, right, so what do you, what do you, like, you know, what do you do for work? And then I explain them all of this and they're like, okay, but like, what do you actually do? Like, <laughs> what is all of this about? Like, what is this useful for? So there's actually one of my favorite things about graph neural networks is that they can have, in my opinion, like unlimited applications. So, they're very, it, there's a lot of flexibility because um, basically you can imagine any system as a network or as a graph, and then you can apply, you know, ask the right, asking the right questions, you can find the right models to, to solve them. So some of the applications that graph neural networks have been proven useful for are, for instance, like molecule um, property prediction. So when we have graphs of molecules and we're trying to predict physical chemical properties or we're trying to predict toxicity, um, this is quite useful for like drug discovery, drug development. We also have knowledge graph completion. So with this massive amount of information we have at the moment, um, there was, there are some kind of companies. There's, um, there has been some efforts that, you know, create these knowledge graphs. So we, by using graph neural networks, we can kind of access and we can infer um, some of the information that we may not have on knowledge graphs. Um, can be used for also social network analysis, cybersecurity. Um, again, recommendation systems if we're dealing with this. Um, bipartite graphs, um, 3D shape recognition. So this is also when we're dealing with kind of, as we've seen, almost like computer vision, but like 3D, we can apply these methods to kind of meshes, to volumes, um, and also traffic transportation networks, chip design. So there's a lot of different applications, really, um, of, this, of these kind of models. And by understanding how they work and um, some of the properties they have, uh, we may be able to find even more. So. I think that is it for me. Like, I guess the question now is whether I have managed to influence you or to make you a little bit more interested in, in graphs. Um, and yeah, I guess that's a question for you, uh, but also open to, to any questions um, that you may have. So yeah, thank you.